I'm in Joshua chapter 9, and I'm going to talk about this Gibeonite deception. It's a pretty wild thing that happens in this chapter. If you've never read it, you're missing out. It's a great chapter in the Bible. In Genesis 9-1, it says, And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys, and in all the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite and the Jebusite heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. What does that remind you of? Battle of Armageddon, when everybody's gathered together against our Joshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jesus and Joshua is the same name. It both means Jehovah saves. And he's got these giants gathered together against them, those Amorites, those Canaanites. These are giants gathered together against him. It says, And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, so they heard about it, they did work wildly, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clouded upon their feet and old garments upon them. And all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. So they're acting like they're coming from a faraway place, uh, making it look like their stuff's old and worn out and molded up. But they're really their neighbors. And they went to Joshua and to the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country. Now therefore make ye a league with us. You know, join up with us. We're from far away. But we've heard about you. We've heard about your God. You know. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? So Joshua's suspecting something's going on here. And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye? And from whence come ye? And they said unto him, From a very far country, thy servants are come because of the name of the Lord thy God, for we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. So word got out then. They didn't have social media. They didn't have news. They didn't have all that. But word was traveling fast about God and about Israel. And he did all that. And, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sahan, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtoreth. Wherefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore, now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it's dry and it's moldy. So they're pretending, you know, they had this hot food that's, and they've been on this trip for so long now their food's moldy. And they said, And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and the behold, they be rent. And these our garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. And the men took their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. So Israel took their food from them. Why would you want that nasty food? Who knows? But they did it, and they didn't ask God, is this a good idea? And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live, and the princes of the congregation swear unto them. So this is one of the rare occasions that Joshua messes up. So Israel and Joshua, they've already faced great victories. They had a big loss at Ai, but they redeemed themselves, and now they're coming off of a great victory in Ai. So as usual, here comes the enemy. Here comes the enemy right after a victory, and their strategy is different than the other ones. This enemy strategy is different. The Gibeonites have said to themselves, if we can't beat them, then we're going to join them. But they must work wildly, because Joshua is not a novice here. As you know, Ephesians 6.11 mentions the wiles of the devil. So they're working wildly like the devil. And in Numbers 25.18, it mentions how Israel got vexed with the wiles of the Midianites. You see, the enemy is wildly, like the wily coyote. You'll notice in Joshua 9.3, the enemy comes after they hear what Joshua had done in Ai and Jericho. Right after, you know, Right away after I got saved and the devils heard what Jesus had done in me, I was attacked by false teachers trying to get me to go astray. I was never a problem to the devil before, but now I was entering into his territory. So he's developed some strategies that he hoped would get me off track. And he did many times, just like he did with you. Here, here are some strategies, though, that I'm going to tell you that the enemies might try on you. 
Number one, forming alliances with you. What a what a crazy strategy. What a tricky strategy. The in uh, verses four through seven, the Gibeonites are actually the Havites of verse one. The Gibeonites that are trying to deceive Joshua and Israel, they're actually the Havites of verse one, who were also part of those that were gathered together against Joshua and Joshua nine two. But now they've they're separate from those other guys. They've got a new strategy. Instead of trying to beat them, they're going to join them. So they're going to form alliances with you, and they're going to have fake IDs. They're going to have fake IDs. The Hivites were also against Joshua, but the Gibeonites, who are the Hivites, have a different approach. As I said, they can't stop Israel head on, so they got to disguise who they were to join them. So a strategy of the enemy against the saints can be infiltration. You know, Paul talks about grievous wolves that are going to enter in among the sheep, Acts 20, 29, and get in among the people. You know, Peter talks about it in 2 Peter 2, 1. They do this by feigning themselves just men. You know, you, I'm reminded of that verse in Luke 20, 20 about people that feign themselves just men. Feigns mean like pretend. They pretend to be just men, as in men that are just uh, they they slide you a fake ID that says the apostles of Christ. You know, over in Second Corinthians eleven thirteen, Paul talks about how the devil's ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. The devil transforms himself into an angel of light. Don't be tricked by everything that looks so good, like preachers that that everything they say is so great all the time. You can be tricked by them. The you know, a flattering lips is a snare. You know, the Gibeonites knew they could get clob they would get clobbered by Israel. So their strategy is to join up. You know, Satan realizes he can trip up believers if he can infiltrate the church as a teacher or a pastor. You know, many times that happens. He'll infiltrate the church through the leadership, through the preaching, through the teaching, through the song leader. You know, they'll show the the Gibeonites showed up with a flattering title. What did they call themselves? Ambassadors. It said they made as if made as if they were so. These are wolves in ambassadors' clothing. They got fake IDs. They got flattering lips. They form alliances through fake IDs and flattering lips. A strategy of the enemy is to use this smooth talk. In Joshua nine eight, they refer to themselves as Israel's servants. They even praise the Lord God and and can even brag on some of his miracles. You know, there's a lot of preachers like that. They they claim to be servants. They praise the Lord God, and they know a little bit of Bible so they can brag on his miracles, just like the Gibeonites did in verses 9 through 10. They said they heard about all that he did in Egypt, all that he did against Og and all that. So a strategy of the enemy is just smooth talk to make you think that he's one of you. But with feigned words, they make merchandise of you, Second Peter 2, 3. With good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple, Romans sixteen eighteen. The devil knows we can be prideful, so he, he'll, he'll try that on us. We can be prideful, so when somebody's trying to flatter us, we just eat it up because we're so full of pride. But it, you, you got to just want God to get the praise. Don't be so, so impressed by all this flattery. They're going to be subtle. But uh, there's he's gonna the devil's gonna be subtle, but he can't force you against your will. Notice the Gibeonites had to give them a proposal and say, "We be from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us." You know they had to give the proposal. You're not forced into doing anything. Joshua wasn't forced into doing anything. So th they're they're gonna a strategy of the enemy is to form alliances with you. Number two. A strategy of the enemy is to fuse the truth with error. Fuse the truth with error. In verses 10 through 14, and in verse 10, they speak about great truths about the Lord, as we talked about. In verse 11, the elders of their country probably did tell them to go meet with Israel. And their, their bread was dry and moldy. Their clothes were rent. But... The lie was it wasn't because of a long journey. Part of it was true. Part of it was a lie. They fused the truth with error. That's a strategy of the enemy. 
they're going to come to you with fraudulent bread. Just like they did in verse 12. That bread was old and moldy, not because of a long journey. They wanted the Israel to think the bread was old and moldy because of a long journey. Just as Satan will tell you the Alexandrian manuscripts are better because they appear to be older. That's fraudulent bread. And a lot of Christians, they eat that bread right up. It, it, the, it fuses truth with error. A lot of Christians, they swallow up the bad bread for this reason. Just as the men of Israel took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. They just eat it up. In verse 14, Israel didn't ask counsel at the mouth of the Lord. They just ate it up. Even though the bad bread contains some of the word of God, some truth, it doesn't mean it's good to partake of it. A little leaven leaven at the whole lump. But truth with error is more deceptive. What we have in the KJV is fresh bread that can't get dry and moldy. But what does Joshua say to the Gibeonites? He says, Peradventure ye dwell among us. This shows the truth was right in Joshua's face. You know, the devil knows the Holy Spirit through the scriptures reveals to you the falsehood. But the fraudulent bread is used to trick the saint. Joshua attempts to try the spirits. You know, in 1 John 4, 1, it says, try the spirits, you know, to see where they are of God. You know, many false prophets are into the world. You know, Joshua tries the spirits. He asks the questions, who are ye and from which come ye? You know, he's skeptical. Who, who are you guys? But he failed to get a victory here because he relied on what he saw. He's relying on what he's seeing. Instead of what God would say and asking counsel of him, he relied on what he saw. In verse 14, and you can't judge by appearance. Judge righteous judgment. You know, don't judge by appearance. John 7, 24. Consider how the devil might use a charismatic pastor to get you to rely on your experience, to rely on what you saw walking by sight and other evidence that you can see with your eyes and they'll put that over the word of God itself. You can't rely on what you see. You can't rely on this fraudulent bread that looks good. For example, wear and tear on a Bible doesn't always mean the false preacher has read it. Bible believers get Bibles all the time nowadays. So they may be carrying a Bible with less wear and tear. You know, I got all kinds of Bibles, and I, I like to carry all of them. You know, some false teacher out there may have used the same Bible for 30 years. He doesn't care about getting him a nice new Bible. He doesn't love the Bible that much. And it's gotten a lot of wear and tear on it through him carrying it, not reading it. It's got some sunburns, but not wear, not wear from page turns. So don't be fooled. Don't be fooled by fraudulent bread. They fuse truth with error with their fraudulent bread. They fuse truth with error with their false doctrine. The Gibeonites used bottles that were rent to deceive. They most likely would have filled old bottles with fresh drink for a short journey. So, you know what they did? They put new wine into old bottles. What does that remind you of? A devilish strategy is to use New Testament teaching for the Old Testament and Old Testament tribulation or millennium teachings for the church age. You know, the Lord said in Mark 2, 22, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles. Doctrine specifically for the New Testament doesn't belong in the Old Testament or vice versa, just like you don't put new wine into old bottles. But the strategy of wrongly dividing fuses truth with error because you will always have Bible to back up your bad doctrine, but you're still lying. You can use the Bible to say anything. You just, to, to deceive people, you put the truth in the wrong dispensation. 
But notice that the Gibeonites claim to be from a far country. Well, the Bible, well, the, the gospel the, is good news from a far country. Proverbs 25, 25. The false prophet will pretend he's got that good news from a far country, but it more so resembles that the far, the far country that the prodigal visited. Luke 15, 23. Just because the Gibeonites are from a far country, they're lying, but even if they were, Joshua wasn't supposed to fellowship with them. He wasn't supposed to make a league with them. In verse 10, you'll notice those Gibeonites, when they're going over, they're going over uh, victories and stuff. They leave out Israel's victory at Ai and Jericho. They didn't talk about that. You see, many times a false teacher will say much truth, but he'll leave out something very, very relevant. You don't know, always judge a false prophet false prophet by what he says you judge him by what he won't say sometimes there's a he'll say a lot of things that's true but he'll leave out something that's really really true you know they fused truth with air they got fraudulent bread they got false doctrine the next enemy strategy is fashion statements and verse 4 verse 5 verse 13 Look at those fashion statements. In verse 4, the Gibeonites had old sacks, old shoes, in verse 5, and old garments in verse 13. You know, they got these fashion statements. People will use filthy rags as a fashion statement. The Gibeonite strategy was to appear pitiful. Their strategy was to make them feel sorry for them. Their strategy was to get in some old clothes to make it seem as if they had been on a long journey. The enemy can use old and raggedy clothes to appear more spiritual to some. We shouldn't have only respect to them that wear the gay clothing. You know, James 2, 3 talks about that. Don't just have respect unto them that got nice clothes. But we also shouldn't esteem those in vile raiment as higher either. It works both ways. People are going to use filthy rags to deceive. People, the next thing, they're going to appear filthy rich to deceive. A fashion statement appearing filthy rich. Why do you think they refer to the enemy as wolves in sheep's clothing? In Matthew 7, 15. Why do you think the scribes love to walk in long robes? Luke 20, 46. Why do you think the rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen? Luke 16, 19. Outwardly, he would appear better than the beggar, right? The clothes prove nothing, though. The rich man went to hell. Lazarus went to paradise. The clothes proved nothing. John wore camel's hair and a leather girdle. Moses and Elijah preached in sackcloth and ashes. You need to stop focusing on how the person is dressed. It is modest apparel that matters for the dress. And the enemy in nice clothes could be also immodest if those nice clothes are just for attention. The words that come out of the mouth or what shows the real Bible believer. You know, the gay clothing that James 2, 3 talks about can be used to deceive you. You know, the mega church guys deceive the simple into thinking that their $5,000 suits and bank account is God's blessing on them and their ministry, but it's just benefits of selling out to the false angel of light. You know, the devil, sometimes it pays to serve the devil but it only pays for a temporary time because the pleasures of sin only last for a season. You know, the devil was at one time lifted up in his beauty. He was all decked out in gold and silver and precious stones and pearls, Ezekiel 28, 13. So it isn't far-fetched that his men would deck themselves out to appear righteous. They use fashion statements to deceive, whether it be filthy rags or appearing filthy rich. Now, the next thing is they fool you into forsaking God. Verse 14 says, The men took their victuals and asked not counsel of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them in verse 14. They fool you into forsaking God with this fictitious unity. It's fake. Verse 15 says, Joshua made peace with them, made a league with them. He wasn't supposed to do that. One of the rare times that Joshua messes up. So even though you got all these characters that are types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, even his types and pictures can't measure up to him because Jesus Christ is the only perfect man. The devil can trick you into joining up with his crowd for financial gain, for popularity, getting a bigger following, 
cutting corners to win souls, whatever. The unity will always be fake because can two walk together except they be agreed, as Amos said? Just because the Gibeonites claim to be impressed with the God of Israel doesn't mean they would have the same goals or the same morals or be sincere believers of the word that Joshua would give them. Paul says it so plainly in Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. He says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians 6.17 while Christians who aren't Bible believers and don't care about doctrine might be your brothers, any real fellowship with them would be fictitious unity. You would, there'd be no real unity there. They don't care about the Bible. They may be saved, but they don't care about the Bible. They don't care about any real fellowship around what you should fellowship around. You know, a, a non-denominational pastor told me one time, and I'm not against non-denominational. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm about, do you believe the Bible or you don't? That's what I'm concerned about. But a non-denominational pastor told me one time that I could just come to his church just as I am. And I, I like that. I want to come just as I am. I want to be me. I don't want to put up some on some spiritual front when I walk into a building. But I found out that that just come just as you are stuff, it's all just a gimmick to get you to join up. He claimed that, he looked at me and said, you don't have to wear a suit and tie to this church. I could just come as myself. You know, all that kind of stuff sounds appealing. And I don't care about clothes. It doesn't bother me a bit. But then you know what? I hadn't even spoke to this guy about anything I believed. Then he tried to talk me out of my King James Bible for 30 minutes after I told him that I was a Bible believer. This was enlightening because he was already proving that he wouldn't take me as I am. Any fellowship with him would be fake unity. We would never see eye to eye. He doesn't take me as I am. These non-denominational churches that are just all about just being so loosey-goosey, they're not going to take you as you are any more than the self-righteous Pharisee IFB are going to take you as you are. you got to just... Pray the Lord will lead you to a group of Bible, Bible believers who take you as you are. And you can fellowship with real unity because you believe the Bible. Not because you meet a certain list of standards. Not because you got the same convictions. But because you believe the Bible. And see, that guy is no more accepting of me than a self-righteous IFB church would be accepting of me. It's all fictitious unity. It's all a big show with some big egos behind it. You know, his whole plan was to get me to join up, and by doing so, I'd eventually quit consulting with the Lord, just like Joshua did with the Gibeonites. He quit consulting with the Lord and joined up. You know, if I could quit consulting with the Lord and forsake God in my walk, my new authority would be my scholarship and my experiences. That was that guy's authority. His scholarship, how smart he was in the languages and the other original languages, all that. And he said his experience. He, this is, I ain't, I ain't kidding. He, told, he looked at me and told me, you can't deny the experience. He was talking about his tongue speaking. So he was relying on his scholarship, his experience, not the word of God itself. So they're going to fool you into forsaking God with fictitious unity. They're going to fool you into forsaking God with this feigned peace, fake peace. Joshua makes peace in verse 15. You know, the Lord continued to be with Israel even in this mistake, but they didn't have as much peace between them and the Lord after making peace with idolaters. No matter how much temporary peace you get from a pet sin, from a, a lost boyfriend, girlfriend, from an unbelieving friend or some type of idol or career, whatever it is, there, it's it's never real peace. It's just the peace that the world gives. John fourteen twenty seven. It's just pleasure of sin that lasts for a season. Real peace is found in being saved in the will of God. And even when tribulation comes, you can fall back into the peace of God. Just like that game you play where you say, I trust you and you fall back. 
into somebody's arms. That's the way it is with the Bible. It's always going to be there. You know, the Father wants close fellowship. It's like when my kids are playing close by, you know, your kid, you're out somewhere, your kids are playing close by, you're at peace. They're at peace. But in this day and time, the more they stray away, a few more feet away at a time from where I'm sitting, the less peace of mind that I have. And then I start yelling, come back, you're too far away. Just like the Father does when I'm straying from Him. You know, when you get saved and you join up in the Lord's army, this doesn't always mean sunshine and roses. You're going to face the enemy as a roaring lion, as an Og king of Bashan, as the Gibeonites talked about in verse nine, in, uh, in chapter 9 and verse 10, or as an angel of light. You know, he's going to appear as an angel of light, as he did with the Gibeonites. The enemy's strategy, whatever it may be, will always involve deception. Even if it promises peace in the present, it takes away peace in the long run. The enemy will promise you liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption. Look at the promises that the devil laid on Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4. It was always a temporary fix. All of his temptations were a temporary fix or a temporary pleasure, but would have, it would have resulted in ruin. Imagine each temptation, each promise, each proposal from the enemy as just a little fiery dart that the enemy is firing. And imagine the word of God as a sword that can cut it in half before it makes contact. You have to take each fiery dart one at a time and day by day until the battle is over.